welcome to another edition of Crosstalk. Um, we are continuing to explore uh, the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And our new series, uh, we've talked about it, but we're trying to do stories from each of the four Gospels. And we're going to do two rounds of that. Um, one story from each of the four Gospels about Jesus' life and ministry. And then another set of stories, one from each Gospel about Holy Week. Uh, and um, the events leading up to Good Friday and Easter. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've done Matthew and we've done Mark, and this week we're turning to Luke. But before we talk about Luke, uh, we just wanted to kind of reemphasize the reason that we're going into this. Um, we all know, we're very familiar with the Protestant idea, which I think is a very right idea, mm -hmm. that our salvation is really based on this personal relationship that we have with Jesus. Um, that's language that we're very used to. But, uh, even though we're used to the language, sometimes I think that uh, we do a bad job of getting to know Jesus. Um, we all know the uh, funny thing, I guess it was a country song, Enough About You, Let's Talk About Me. <laughs> right. We're all guilty of doing that with Jesus. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're so busy talking that we don't always let Jesus talk for himself, and sometimes we miss him. Um, another image or experience that pops to my mind lately, uh, you know, we're getting ready for election stuff this fall, and we've all been in conversations with people, and uh, the other person automatically assumes that we agree with them. And you get this long conversation and you don't have to say anything and the person again just assumes that you're on the same page and the reality might be quite different you might have very different views right and if you don't say anything they, they would never know and then they tell your friends that, that you're a supporter of all of their causes may or may not be true um, we're guilty of doing that with Jesus I think that's right putting all kinds of ideas uh, on Jesus that may or may not belong so it's just an immeasurably important to always be bringing ourselves back to the Gospels, which are the, the four authoritative versions of Jesus' life and ministry. And uh, the church has always said these are the most accurate reflections of who Jesus actually was. Mm. You want to add anything? Well... You're exactly right. I mean, we, we encounter Jesus in the pages of the New Testament, and we get, um, like we, we talked a little bit last week, we don't get quite a biography, but we do get um, an incredible picture of who this person Jesus is, both as Son of Man and Son of God. And, you know, we also talk about, uh, and we have been talking about, the Holy Spirit, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit is to point us to Jesus. And so I believe that as we take up the pages of the New Testament, uh, read them faithfully, not trying to put our um, impressions, not put our desires on the text, but just to read the text, I think the Holy Spirit does, you know, open up the person of Jesus to us. And, he, and Jesus becomes very much a real person uh, with multi kind of dimensional personality. I mean, all of us are are difficult I mean, or complex not difficult but we're complex and so when we get to know jesus we're getting to know this this very very real person mm -hmm. as the holy spirit uh interprets it for us but it all starts as we engage these texts yeah and getting to know jesus i think happens on a couple of different levels i know personally i would love to know uh, what his mannerisms were like you know if he was a funny person if he was a serious person those are questions that we're not going to have answered when we come to the Gospels. Um, but what we really do get is a, is a couple of things. One is a sense of who Jesus thought he was. Um, we're, we're given uh, a lot of information that sort of helps us understand what Jesus thought he was up to and what he thought he was called to. Um, we're also given a lot of ideas about what Jesus cared about. Um, where was Jesus' heart and where was Jesus' mind? What did he think about? Um, and these all come out um, as Jesus talks with his friends, as Jesus teaches the crowds, 
and as Jesus interacts with the people around him. And again, going back to this idea of a personal relationship, um, we know that Jesus cares about who we are. Um, but the, the really important thing about this personal relationship is that we begin to care about who he is. Yeah. And it's not a process of Jesus beginning to see the world the way that we do. It's a way, it's a process of us beginning to see the world the way Jesus does. Mm. And I do believe that that, that outlook, that worldview um, is accessible to us in the Gospels. We get a good idea of what, what's on Jesus' mind and heart and what should be on our minds and hearts. Exactly, yeah. All that, I think, you know, what we need to know is there. Not yeah, everything yeah. we would like to know is there, but everything we really need to know is there. And uh, as we go through these Gospels, there, there is so much to explore. And, you know, we might have gone through them in, a, in another time, but when we visit these, um, these accounts again, they just pop with new life. There's always something new there. And so we are just deepening and growing in a relationship with Christ as we interact with these, uh, these accounts. Mm -hmm. So um, as we said, we are moving on to Luke this week. And we have been working out of the early parts of Matthew and Mark, out of chapter 1 in both cases. Mm -hmm. When we come to Luke this week, though, we're going to be moving a little bit further into the story. We're going to start in chapter 10. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful story about uh, Jesus empowering his friends uh, to go out and join him in his work. Before we jump there, though, I thought it might be fun to start in chapter one of Luke, just to give you a little, to, to give us a chance to talk about some of the background and who Luke is and what Luke is up to. Another part of our series has been trying to understand how the original audiences affect what the writers are going to put in there. So um, if it's true, and it's a very reasonable um, postulation that Matthew is writing to Jewish readers who find themselves now excluded from the Jewish community. And they're asking themselves, what does it mean for us to be God's people? Uh, that lines up with a lot of Matthew's concerns. Um, when we talk about Mark, we have a, a community who uh, has experienced this in incredible leadership. If Paul and Peter both do end up in Rome at roughly the same time, uh, if they are both martyred at roughly the same time, that Roman church would have known them. That Roman church also would have been under the gun in the mid-60s um, as Nero's persecution is breaking out in Rome. Mm -hmm. um, and they're asking these big questions about the nature of uh, power and authority and, and how do we interact with this world around us. Um, we would not be honest with ourselves if we didn't all admit that the stories about Jesus' authority that we read in the Bible um, don't always line up with what we see around us. It should be a question for anyone who's taking it seriously. Yeah, and, and it was a question for his followers. I mean, Absolutely. you know, while all the accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, give us different insights into the person of Jesus. I mean, all of them agree that, you know, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and he just did not meet the expectations uh, of his followers or of the leadership in Jerusalem. I mean, he, he was doing different things, and his authority was a different kind of authority. That's really screams out at us as we read these texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely, completely different kind of authority yeah. on many levels. Go back and, and watch Sunday's sermon uh, or last week's crosstalk. Um, this, this week we're turning to Luke, and uh, Luke is an interesting uh, person to talk about. Um, and I guess I'll just sort of open it up. What where would you begin if someone asked you, who is Luke? Who is Luke? Well, you know, um, all of these people um, are, are interesting persons and people that I would 
really like to know. I would love to know Matthew, love to know Mark and meet Peter. But uh, Luke is one of those folks that I, I think I would really like to be around. Um, he, he, we'll get into it in, in a few moments, but uh, he, he is, um, he, he's just sort of a, an invitational sort of person, come into relationship. He seems very relational. So that's one thing about Luke, I would say. He's, uh, he, he just seems like a kind of a person I would love to be around. But more on the historical side, um, we pick up stories about Luke um, in his second volume. Luke Acts is kind of one work, but the second volume, the Acts of the Apostles, we meet Luke there as a traveling companion of Paul, and uh, not just Paul, but also um, uh, Silas is gonna be there, John Mark is gonna be there, there's gonna be an entourage that he moves with. And so we, we pick up uh, Luke uh, with Paul as he prepares to go across uh, from um, present-day Turkey into Greece and uh, going to, to move with the Apostle Paul. Um, you know, also we get this idea, it's um, uh, in the tradition and lots of preachers talk about it, but there's evidence in both Luke and in Acts that Luke is, you know, kind of attentive to details concerning uh, physical reality. And so, you know, he's often called Dr. Luke and maybe uh, part of the medical profession. And that was one of the services that he was able to give Paul uh, and, and undoubtedly others, but to, to care for their, their physical needs and have a, a sense of, of uh, that world. So here he's a kind of a professional man. He's uh, engaging, he's part of a larger group. And um, uh, also he's a pretty good historian. You're probably gonna read for us his introduction, uh, both to uh, Luke and particularly to Acts. Uh, he's, he's just, you know, he's writing this for a particular audience. These are details that I've gone over. Um, th these are not, I didn't know Jesus, but these are people that did. These are how they reacted. These are the stories carefully gathered. So he's, um, you know, meticulous in his historical accounting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, well pointed out, Luke is a person that we meet attached to Paul. And that happens in Acts. It also happens in Paul's letters. For example, at the end of Colossians, Paul often ends his letters um, with exchanges of greetings. The people who are with me greet you. I greet uh, everybody who's with you. Please send my greetings kind of thing. And if I know people, Paul says, if there are people that I know in your congregation, please say a special hello to them for me. So at the end of uh, Colossians, Paul adds that our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send their greetings to you as well. So um, the book of Acts places Luke as a member of Paul's entourage. Uh, at a handful of places in the book of Acts, it slips from the third person, he, she, into we. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of get that, is this really a first person account? Questions. Um, and then in Paul's letters, we have mention of this person, Luke, who happens to be a physician, um, who is part of Paul's entourage. Um, and again, the, <laughs> the, um, the spirit of the age is always one of skepticism, but even with great skepticism, nobody's ever proved otherwise. So <laughs> we continue to accept that Luke is probably this member of Paul's entourage. Um, we're going to jump to uh, his introduction here in Luke, but before we do that, it's also interesting just to place Luke in the orbit of Paul. It's not been too long ago that we did a long series on Paul, and, uh, and then we came back to Paul when we were talking about the letters in the New Testament. Uh, but one of the things that we encounter with Paul is this incredibly well-traveled person. Paul is a world traveler. He goes all over the known world at the time, and he senses as his call that he feels like he has received directly from Jesus, is that it's his job to go out and spread the good news with people who've never heard it before. He always begins with the Jewish synagogue and the towns where he goes, but then he tries to move quickly to non-Jewish 
audiences, to Gentile audiences. And Paul has this really amazing mind where he is able to converse with people on many different levels. If you're Jewish, I'll talk to you as a Jewish person. If you're a Gentile and you like the philosophers, I'll talk to you as a philosopher. If you happen to be into playwrights, let's talk about playwrights. Paul has this incredible mm. body of knowledge um, that he can enter into conversation with people with. And uh, he's part of this larger uh, Hellenistic uh, culture. Paul grew up in Tarsus. Uh, Tarsus is the place where Mark Antony and Cleopatra kind of held up for a while. Um, before their unfortunate demise. Uh, Tarsus is a cosmopolitan place. Um, and this is just a part of who Paul is and how he interacts with mm -hmm. people. And it seems to be a part of who Luke is too. He's a part of a big world. And Luke is not afraid of this big world. It's a big world that he embraces. It's also a big world that he believes Jesus embraces. And that becomes a major part of Paul and Luke's message. Is that yes... Jesus is Jewish Messiah, but Jesus wants to make you a part of the family too. Um, and so this message of um, inclusion, and please don't hear any kind of woke stuff, uh, but this message of God wants to make a, a place in his family for everybody is a major part of yeah. Luke's thought, and it's a major part of Paul's thought. Mm -hmm. So they really go together in that way. Um, so going back just to the beginning verses of Luke, um, very different from the, the other three Gospels. We don't get this in the other three Gospels. But Luke is writing to a patron or a friend or maybe just a stylized audience. We'll talk about that in a minute. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those uh, who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed like a good idea to me also to write down an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know with certainty the things that you have been taught. Uh, pretty straightforward. Paul's right, or, uh, Luke says this is Fourth, my friend Theophilus, um, an orderly account. I've done the investigations. An orderly account so that you can have certainty of the things that you have been instructed on. Theophilus is an interesting title. Um, it could absolutely be a name. Interestingly, Theophilus is a name that means uh, the God lover. Is this a particular individual or is this an open letter to God lovers? It's hard to say. But the spirit, I think, that Luke is writing in is very important. I want you to know with certainty. Um, so I've gone back and I've talked to as many people as I can. This also really fits in with Paul. Um, Paul has that wonderful section in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I handed on to you what was given to me as of first importance. Um, and then Paul says, if you have any questions about it, I know at least 500 people who met Jesus, the risen Jesus. Go talk to them. Um, so, again, this idea of eyewitness accounts, uh, getting as many stories as possible in order to have certainty is a, a profoundly important idea to Paul and to many of the early Christians. Mm. This is not just hearsay. This isn't something that was made up. As, Paul, uh, as um, Paul says in the book of Acts, this stuff was not done in a corner. Um, and Luke wants his readers to know that and to have confidence because of it. Mm. If you had anything? I couldn't add anything. That's terrific. I think that's exactly what Luke is about. And, and what makes the book so engaging, uh, he is writing to people that love God. He wants them to love God. And it's like, let me tell you these stories. And so many of the stories um, are stories of, the, the, many of the parables that we remember are of course coming from Luke, uh, the, the parable of the lost son or the uh, prodigal son, the, all the lost sheep, lost coins, the, the good Samaritan, all, all of these things are, are coming to us from Luke and uh, they're just delightful as, as well as 
challenging, encouraging. There are just so, so many things, but uh, Luke has done a good job in gathering this information for mm -hmm. us. Um, before talking briefly about the gospel, it is important to, just to reemphasize that Luke is the first half of, the gospel of Luke is the first half of a two-part work. The second half is the book of Acts, or the actions of the apostles, the stuff the apostles did. Uh, they really do belong together. And uh, if you want a really fun um, exercise, uh, over the next week or two, go back and read all of the sermons that are given in Acts. Um, they're absolutely brilliant. No scholar would deny that these are all written by Luke. Um, sometime after they happened. Is this word for word what Peter said on the day of Pentecost? I don't know. Is it the spirit of what, Pen of what Peter said? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Luke is a pretty good speech writer, and Luke is pretty good at putting ideas together. A lot of what we know about the life of Paul comes from the book of Acts. Um, and a lot of the ideas that we get um, from Paul actually come from the book of Acts, and these wonderful speeches that, that Paul has. Um, going back to the idea about uh, getting to know God, Luke does want people to get to know God, and in Luke's world, there were a lot of people that at least said that they wanted to get to know God. I think the best place, the best story to go talk about this is Paul's experience in Athens, which we get from Acts recorded by Luke. Mm -hmm. We also get Paul's speech in Athens recorded by Luke or written by Luke. Um, and what Paul encounters in Athens is a, it's a college town. It's the college town. Uh, you might think about it today. There's nothing even in the United States that compares, I don't think. It would be like an Oxford or a Cambridge. Uh, you know, a whole city that has been dedicated to learning from time immemorial. Uh, dedicated to ideas and to thought and to conversation and um, that's a big part of Athenian identity and so Paul goes to share with them the good news that you can know God and you have that wonderful speech um, I know that you're pious people I know that you want to give God God's proper due I see all of your altars and I also see that you have an altar written to the unknown God let me tell you about the unknown God, the God that you haven't met yet. And Paul gives them the famous speech um, on the Areopagus, the, the little hill that's right underneath the Acropolis where all the serious people got together to talk about big ideas. Um, that spirit of Paul that we meet in the story of Paul to Athens is a spirit that we meet in Luke and his gospel. I know that you want to know God, but you need to know who God is seriously. You need to know who God is well. You need to know um, with authority what this Jesus cares about and uh, where his mind and his heart is. Um, it's not good enough just to know the unknown God. Mm. It's not good enough just to put our ideas there. Um, so with that, we're turning to this story um, out of Luke chapter 10, uh, which is happening kind of in the middle of Jesus's ministry. It actually happens in a very pivotal point in Luke's gospel. Um, we touched on it last week when we dealt with Mark. At some point during Jesus's ministry, he changes focus and Jesus comes to the realization that it is his call, it is his job to go to Jerusalem and to die. And so there's a point in Jesus's ministry where he begins to speak clearly with his disciples. This is what I'm going to do. We talked about it last week in Mark chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is one of these turning points uh, at the end of the chapter, I guess, is when Jesus will set his face resolutely for Jerusalem, uh, set his, his, uh, set all of his mind and attention on this, you know, task that lies before him. But before he does that in chapter 10, uh, he invites some of his friends to start sharing in the work with him. 
Do you want to add anything at this point? Yeah, only that it, it's, it's, you know, we've been focusing on Jesus and it seems odd in a way. The story this week is about a story about Jesus, mm -hmm. but it's also about people like you and me. Yeah. And so somehow we find ourselves involved in this story. Yeah. So um, you do get a sense of urgency in Jesus's ministry in Luke's gospel in the same way that you had that sense of urgency in uh, Mark's gospel last week. But there is a, a very different emphasis or a, a different tone. In Mark's gospel, there's a lot of frustration. And we talked about it last week. Nobody understands who Jesus is. Nobody understands Jesus's authority, including the uh, disciples, the 12 chosen ones especially. And Jesus ends up saying things towards the end of his time with them, like, how much longer do I have to put up with you people? Um, we don't get that sentiment yeah. at all in Luke. Instead of being frustrated with his followers, Jesus is forever inviting them to join him in his work. So we know that Jesus chose 12 special uh, disciples. Um, but in Luke, the... It's not just 12 people that are following Jesus. He doesn't just have 12 friends. He has lots of friends. And he has lots of committed disciples, lots of committed followers who have given up everything they have to follow him. In chapter 10 of Luke, Jesus appoints, and the, the word that's used is appoints, 72 of his friends to go ahead of him to all of the towns that he's planning to visit and to prepare the way before he arrives. Um, so he uh, gives them instructions on how they're to go out and do the work. They're to go out two by two. Um, and they are to uh, announce ahead of time that the kingdom of God is drawing near. Repent, Jesus' favorite sermon, really his only sermon. Um, and to sort of prepare the ground uh, before he's coming. This sense of urgency is emerging Jesus seems to be saying, my time is short and the, there's a lot of work. It's one of the wonderful places where he reminds them that uh, the harvest is large, but the workers are few. We got to get out and do this. Mm. So Jesus sends out his friends. And um, then when they come back, he says, I, I've given you authority to do this work with me. Last week, we talked about this unique authority that Jesus has that only Jesus has in Mark's gospel. But in Luke's gospel, Jesus is always trying to share his authority. Do the work with me. Let me equip you um, to share with me in this burden, uh, but also in this delight. Uh, because again, we learn in, in chapter 10 that uh, the kingdom doesn't come for free. <laughs> the kingdom doesn't come just because God does it, that the kingdom comes when God and humans are working together. Mm -hmm. um, and so Jesus' invitation is, I'm working for the kingdom to come. You join me in my work for the kingdom to come. I'm giving you my authority to, to join alongside in this work. That's a pretty extraordinary picture. What do you think about it? It is. Uh, you know, I, the occurs to me somebody might say oh well and you know mark and luke are contradictory jesus is frustrated nobody gets it in mark and in luke he's sending out people i you know anybody that's been in um, any kind of um, work whether it's in industry or church or whatever when you're working with people you have a lot of frustration but you also have moments of joy uh, so i don't i don't think any of this is contradictory but it's, it's really terrific that, um, you know, Jesus has this incredible authority and he is sharing it with his, um, uh, his uh, friends. And as we say, there's 72 here. We, we're introduced to men and women, all kinds of people in Luke are coming to follow Jesus. But it also... And he wants them to. They're, he's excited about this. Oh. This is something that really is Jesus' jazz. Yeah, but I think here's where, you know, we... we need to really put Mark and Luke together in that if, if we misunderstand the authority of Jesus, uh, this is not going to work. And, and it seems to me that Jesus is really working uh, by example on the job training 
with these people to make sure that they understand exactly the nature of the kingdom. The, the nature of the kingdom of God is not like the kingdoms of this world. As you were saying, and I thought it was just terrific on Sunday, the kingdoms of this world work with you know punishment and reward. And if you don't get on the, the program, you're gonna get vanquished. But Jesus invites them into this another world of, of uh, authority where you know they have the power to to engage the evil spirits too and they're out healing too and and yet they're, they're on this laying down their life track as well so it's really good to understand this authority and what better way to understand it than on the job training and so that's what jesus is giving these these uh friends uh in, in this episode i think yeah one of the things that we talked about last week and a theme that's going to continue to this week is being able to separate the difference between means and ends. Yeah. And another thing I think that distinguishes uh, the world's authority from this authority that Jesus possesses and wants to share um, is that in the world, authority is an end in and of itself. We want to have power so that we can have what we want. You made it, you got the power. Uh, but Jesus is very clear with his followers that my authority is given only insofar as it works towards the kingdom that the Father is bringing. Um, in our reading, the Jesus' friends come back and they're excited about the authority that they have been able to exercise over the demons, the healings that they've been able to do. And Jesus is excited too, but he reminds them, don't be excited that you have authority. Be excited that you're part of the kingdom. Yeah. Be excited that, that this kingdom is real, that it's not a fairy tale, that it's not make-believe. Be excited at what God is doing. Um, it's much more important than this authority you've got because your authority is just a means to an end. Don't lose sight of the, the end and get caught up in the means. Yeah. I, you know, and again, I just love all of this sort of reinforcement of, of what I've been thinking about. I hope what our church has been thinking about of what does it mean to experience the fullness of Christ, the fullness of the Holy Spirit? And I think it really is this, this idea of koinonia is shared life, shared purposes, um, shared desire. You know, it's when, when our purposes and our desire matches that of Jesus, we're going out for the kingdom. This is not about ego. It's about what God wants to do in the world. I think that's when we really begin to experience this, this fullness of the Spirit. Uh, it's not spectacular. Um, as Major Thomas said, it's, it's always miraculous. I mean, I think we are going to see great things happen when our plans and purposes align with those of God, when we begin to have the heart of God for the world. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's got to be His plan, not ours. And I think that really does define for me the fullness of the work of the Spirit and captures this, this idea of Jesus saying, come along, you know, be my friends. Let's do it together. Yeah, and let me give you power to help. Yeah. Um, so we are returning a little bit to this idea of authority this week, but um, instead of a, an authority that is baffling is an authority that Jesus wants to share because he wants us to be um, working towards the same goal. So I'll, I'll kind of end my part with this and add if you want. Uh, going back to this idea of koinonia, and this is a wonderful New Testament idea, again, that we really get out of Paul. Um, and we talked about this a lot when we did the series on Paul earlier this year and we did the letters. Uh, but originally, if you'll remember, Koinonia is a business partner. And uh, a, 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 the whole idea of um, entering into a Koinonia is, is entering into this partnership mm. where you share a common interest. Um, I think we tend to take that as friendship, but uh, it's important not to lose the business implications. That's right, yeah. A, a friendship you do purely out of enjoyment. There's nothing on the line, but... When you enter into a, a joint venture with someone in business, there's a lot on the line. You've both got skin in the game. You've got to figure out how to make it work together. And you have a common goal. We need this thing to succeed. <laughs> right, right. It, it, it's very serious. And yeah. ideally, you enjoy each other's company. Um, 
but you do have this common drive. I think it's important not to lose that idea when we think about this life, this thing that we've been called into, this relationship with Jesus. Jesus cares about us, but Jesus is not just here to be our friend. Jesus is inviting us in on this venture that we call the kingdom of God. Um, and as partners, business partners in that joint venture, we assume full responsibility, full liability. Um, in order to achieve the end, we are given authority to make these things happen. And in the end, what we receive is we have a full stake in the venture. Mm. We get the full inheritance, the full payout, the full dividend, however you want to say it. I think that it's important for us not to lose that image. It's not a bad one. No, I agree. And I can't add a thing to it. You know, um, just when we think of the parables of Jesus, you know, that well done, good and faithful servant, you know, you've been entrusted and you've invested, you've done well with what you've been given. And that's, boy, that's a partnership, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. With expectations attached. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward to this Sunday as we begin to think, you know, um, about Jesus and then the, the relationship that he's inviting us into. Uh, and it's a wonderful relationship with authority, but also with responsibility. Absolutely. And a payout. And a payout. Very good. Well, Nathaniel, thank you. I, I look forward to, as I said, Sunday and look forward to going on, uh, further as we get this, this multifaceted view of Jesus, which is just really incredible. So my prayer is that uh, you'll stay with us and your relationship with Jesus might grow as we consider this person who's our living Lord. Will you want me to close this with prayer, please? Okay. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our living Lord and sending your spirit among us. And Holy Spirit, we thank you uh, for uh, making Jesus alive to us and coming alongside of us. And wherever we find ourselves, we know we're not alone. We know that uh, we're in good company with you and uh, with your purposes and plans. And also, Lord, we know that we're not alone because you have called us into this great family, uh, the church. So Lord, thank you for all your goodness. Uh, open the eyes of our hearts and our eyes that we might uh, love you more dearly and follow you more closely. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Amen. See you Sunday. Bye.